Thank you. We uh, bid you good afternoon. Uh, the topic which we have is uh, one which has uh, just been given to me, but uh, it is one in which uh, I've been involved with all my life. And uh, I thought that with this topic, uh, we could just begin to show and to demonstrate uh, how, in fact, uh, as a political activist and uh, of course, this history could be shared for most political activists, how, in fact, I came to, unlike, unlike most uh, people in America, begin to see the police apparatus in this country for what it is. Of course, like uh, most people in the United States of America in my early life, uh, I thought the uh, FBI were these good guys who went around and helped everybody. And I thought that they were supposed to be the guys who supported peace and all this nonsense. As a young man at Howard University, I went to work in the South with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Mississippi. And here I thought the legal basis for this work was clear. In fact, all we were trying to do as young students was to get our people the right to vote. Of course, while I may have been a little bit confused about the FBI, I was not certainly... Which one is it? Is it this one? While I, <laughs> while I uh, certainly was aware of the uh, racist and terroristic nature of the United States of America in relationship to Africans, I certainly had not understood the role of the FBI as an organized force of terrorism against my people. This realization would be dawn on, would dawn on me through hard and serious struggle. We said the legal basis for our work in the South was clear, according to the American Constitution, toilet paper. Here it was stated that every man, every woman had the right to vote. Of course, I know the history of my people in this country. I know that my people have never arrived at any position in this country, not even individual positions, without the shedding of blood in mass struggle. This point must be properly understood. It is only when understanding these points that you can come to see properly the real racist and terroristic nature of the FBI and the CIA. I say I know this, and this is clear, all of us knowing here, no one sitting this, in this room can deny any of the following statements I make. One, for Africans to sit in a lousy five and ten ten store where they want to be, they have to shed their blood. For Africans to ride on a bus, even though they pay the same amount of money as anybody else does, in order for them to sit where they want to sit, they have to shed their blood. For Africans to live anywhere in this country where they want to live, even if they have the economic capability of doing so, they have to shed their blood. For African students to attend universities just like any other student in this country, their people must shed their blood. In order for us to get the vote, which everybody gets just like that, even the immigrant who can't even speak English coming here, we Africans, in order to get the vote, we must shed our blood. No one sitting in this audience can show me any example of advancement by the African masses in this country, even individual positions of advancements which have not been acquired at the price of the shedding of the blood of the masses of our people. Consequently, I was aware of this. I wasn't confused. Of course, the job of capitalism, it, well, it lies all the time, not some of the time. Some people get confused. They think it lies some of the time. It lies all the time. Even when it tells the truth, it's a result of a double lie. It lies all the time. So if you're not careful, they will let you think that uh, Africans make progress like everybody else. And the way they write up the histories, he was the first doctor in this area, the first student of this university, the first this. And it makes it appear as if this individual, who's the first doctor or the first student, really worked hard and was special, unlike the rest of the masses of people, and that these qualifications were so much that they had to be granted the position. More lies. No African in this country has arrived at any individual position without the shedding of the blood of the masses of our people. Anytime you see a mayor anywhere in this country, you must know that that mayor arrived at that position only through the shedding of the blood of his people. Anytime you see a student at the University of Delaware, an African student, you must know that student occupies a seat only because of the shedding of the blood of the masses of the people. 
Of course, the logical conclusion must be clear. Since the people shed the blood for these positions, these positions do not belong to the individuals who occupy them. These positions belong only to the masses of the people. The political conclusions must also be clear. Any time you use this position, which has been gained by the blood of the people, not for the people, but for yourself, for your own individual interest, you have already betrayed the blood of the people. This must be properly understood. Once again, this confusion arises because American capitalism tries to confuse us. You know, they will tell you that, oh, you want to hear Kwame Ture? Oh, that man, he was crazy in the 60s. He's crazier in the 90s. I don't know with that. Malcolm says, extreme conditions must have extreme solutions. And we are in certainly extreme conditions. <clears throat> they will tell you that that man, Kwame Ture, he's just uncompromising when he speaks. Everything is either white or black, hot or cold, wet or dry, that there is no middle ground, there is no gray area when he speaks. We are absolutely correct. I am a revolutionary and I speak of principles for which I am willing any time at the drop of a hat to shed my blood. And I will never compromise those principles to live, not me. Consequently, when I speak as a revolutionary, I speak of principles, and when one speaks of principles, there is no middle ground, there is no gray area, everything is hot or cold, wet or dry, black or white, there is no gray area, although some will try to create a gray area or a middle ground where it does not exist. You are students, show me the middle ground. On a test, either you cheat or you do not cheat. Where's the middle ground? You are human beings, tell me. When you recount a story, either you lie or you tell the truth. Where is the middle ground? You are human beings. You live in a world where people have religious beliefs. Either you believe in God or you do not. Where is the middle ground? And some might say we'll try to make middle ground. The other day a sister told me, well, I doubt God, but I still believe in him. Once you start doubting God, you have stopped believing in him. There is no middle ground where principles are concerned. This must be properly understood especially for you as those who come to want to make a contribution to humanity and especially to your people who are a part of suffering humanity. It must be clear here then that if your people are oppressed, either you are for the people or you are against the people, there is no middle ground. This must be properly understood. We see everywhere the capitalist system will try to give you a logical reasoning to make you make middle ground. The other day when speaking to a brother, I said, my brother, our people are oppressed. Yeah, Brother Kwame, you're right. I said, our brother, our people are suffering everywhere. I know you're right. Brother, the government pushing drugs in our people, trying to confuse our youth to stop their rising militancy. I know you're right, brother. He's tried to curse all cause of confusion. The police themselves are arming youth in our, in our communities to bring gang wars, to carry out their drug wars for them. He said, I know you're right, Brother Kwame. I said, brother, you have to come and help the people. He said, well, I can't help them right now. I said, really? He said, but uh, brother Kwame, I'm not against the people. I said, you're not. He said, I don't do nothing against them. I'm not working for the FBI. You know, sure, I ain't helping them, but I ain't against them. I said, you're against them. If your people are oppressed and you are not involved in the struggle to liberate your people, by your very act of inaction, you are against your people. <laughs> this point must be properly underscored. If your mother is being raped and you have the ability to stop the rape and you put your hands behind your back and say, I ain't in this, you're against your mother. If your people are being exploited and you refuse to lift a finger to help exploit your people, you are against your people and you've actively joined the side of the enemy. When we speak of principles here, we say there is no gray area and the choice is clear. That is to say, if any of you sitting here who are Africans have never done anything for your people, you've been against your people. Let that be properly understood. Clearly, the contradictory logical statement is correct. Only we will free us, true or false. True. And if we do not work to free us, who will work to free us? The enemy? Consequently, the points must be properly understood. I said in my early days in Mississippi, I went there thinking that we stood on legal grounds. Now, I must tell you one thing, I was not confused. The confusion and the contradiction which existed between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, I was always on the side of Malcolm X. If you would trace quickly the history, now, I know one thing, I know when I say things that you should know, I know you don't know because I know you love King, but you don't study King, but <laughs> just like you love your people, you don't study them, but you love King anyway. 
<laughs> anyway, Martin Luther King had a feeling in the very beginning of his struggles that the federal government was on the side of the poor African masses. And furthermore, he insisted that our job was just to bring out the racism in the South. And once the federal government saw how racist the attitude was, they themselves would come and solve the problem. Malcolm X used to say, the federal government is your biggest enemy. He said the federal government can send troops to Korea to fight for democracy and have racist pigs in Georgia lynch you and do nothing about it. Malcolm X was clear. Martin Luther King himself came to the same position that Malcolm X did. If you would look at the end of his campaign, the Poor People's Campaign was directed against the federal government. Consequently, one of the great things about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X was the ability to grow and to learn from their errors and to publicly demonstrate this growth and this correction of errors before the masses of our people. So from the very beginning, I knew the federal government was never on my side. I knew they could not be on my side. I was not confused, nor was I confused about the Democratic Party, which had at the same time in it a Kennedy and an Eastland. I knew that Kennedy would not sacrifice Eastland for me. <coughs> And I never thought that could be possible. Consequently, for me, Kennedy was just like Eastland, another racist pig talking sweet honey. So there was no confusion here. But at least I thought somehow I couldn't have consumed that the FBI themselves would be involved. But as we got more and more into work, we were told, and I certainly as a sneak field secretary had many problems with this, that every time there's an incident of burning or shooting or looting or killing or terrorism that the FBI should be called in the local area of the South. I'll give you clear examples. As a young man, I could say that I cut my teeth in organizing in Greenwood, Mississippi. Greenwood, Mississippi is a Delta state, Delta town, and as racist as you can get, full of Ku Klux Klan, white citizens, FBI, police, all of them just shooting us for fun. I was told by the SNCC reps, by my SNCC superiors, that whenever there was an incident, you should go to Greenwood, Mississippi, go to the FBI and make them come and make reports. When I would go into the city hall in Greenwood to get the FBI, I would find them in the office of the police chief just chewing tobacco and swapping jokes about us. This FBI agent would now be forced to leave there, come with me and go make up a report, and all he would do would make up a report. Of course, I never trusted the FBI, I just thought that they would do their job. But in the early days, the FBI made it clear to us, I'll give you one clear example, historical. In the southern part of the state of Mississippi, there was an African there by the name of Herbert Lee, a strong man, a determined man, a man full of consciousness, who recognized that rather than be a slave, he would fight to be free. And Mr. Lee had contacted us and told us to come. He wanted to do some work in the south in the movement there. One of our SNCC superiors, on error, contacted the FBI and told them, well, there's this man, Mr. Herbert Lee, down there. We want to do some work with it. And the FBI gave his name to the local police chief, and Mr. Lee was assassinated within 48 hours. After that, nobody in SNCC looked at the FBI for anything except a chance to shoot these pigs down. We said the FBI gave the information. But the state superiors kept insisting that we call the FBI. Once, when an incident aroused where there was some burning of a house and some brutal, brutal terrorism, normal life in Mississippi for Africans, the snake people called me and said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm not going to do nothing. I'm going to get me some guns, organize our people, and we're going for blood. Said, oh, well, before you do that, you need to get the FBI. The FBI for what? Well, we need to get these, for what? Well, we know they don't do anything, but we need to get these reports because we're going to sue the FBI for not doing their work, and these reports will help us. Well, I'm an organizer, and I'm a disciplined organizer. I've understood all my life, because all my life I have been in organization, all my life, so I have organizational discipline, something that the overwhelming majority of the masses of my people lack. They simply lack organizational discipline because they've never belonged to any organization. Of course, organizational discipline is necessary. Its first necessity is to inform the individual that there's something more important than he or she, the organization and the principles for which it stands. This is necessary in a country like America, where all aspects of individuality is blown completely out of proportion where an African will even tell you, 
work for my people. What do they do for me? They ain't never did nothing for me. Do they pay my bills? I'm out here for me and me alone. Don't nobody help me and I don't need them. Uh, America's a backward country. <laughs> Not only does it make you stupid, it makes you arrogant in your stupidity. <laughs> here it is, screaming, oh, this is backward. All of us sitting here knows that an individual human being isolated from the human species is totally incapable of making any contribution to life. These are biological facts. If you take a kitten the minute it's born before it opens its eyes, you take a dog or puppy before it's born, before, before it opens its eyes when it's born, if you throw both of them in the woods isolated by themselves, they will grow to their fullest animal potential. The dog will walk on all four, he will bark, as soon as he finds a bone, he will love it. The cat will meow, the cat will chase mice as soon as he finds them. But if you take a child, a human being, the minute he or she is born, without opening their eyes, and put them in their woods, isolated by themselves, if they live, if they live, they will never arrive at their fullest human potential. It is questioned whether or not the child will walk. Certainly the child will not talk. And it is clear the child will be able to make no contribution to the society. We push the point one, we push the argument one point further, again sticking clearly within the place of the logics of the statement. We continue to say that a human being isolated from the human species is more stupid than any other animal isolated from its species. Take the same kitten, take the same puppy, take the same child, as soon as they're born, without their eyes open, throw them to live with monkeys. The dog will walk like a dog, bark like a dog, and love bones. The cat will meow like a cat, walk like a cat, and love mice. The child will walk like a monkey, talk like a monkey, eat monkey food, and try to make a contribution to monkey culture. <laughs> the statement then is clear, crystal clear. So that we can smash quickly all of these nonsensical ideas of individuality. The individual is dependent upon the masses of the people for everything. Consequently, the individual must consume themselves to the desires, the struggles, and the aspirations of the masses of the people. This is clear. For the Africans, it is even more clear. We say without the slightest hesitation, any African who rises above the masses of his people have only done so by stepping upon their heads. As a matter of fact, any man trying to pull himself up above the people is a stupid man. It's only when the people rise that you can rise. <laughs> we state all these things for you to see precisely the concept in which we're working. We're talking about these pigs, the FBI. Martin Luther King had a great deal of trust in the FBI. I remember having great discussions with Dr. King about the FBI. Dr. King, they're punks, chumps. No, you know, there are constraints here about jobs, uh, Kwani, and uh, they really do their best. And uh, while it's sometimes hard, uh, you can be sure that uh, in the final analysis, their reports will have an effect. Dr. King had great faith in them. Did you know the FBI was tapping Dr. King's phone? <laughs> <laughs> I knew they were tapping mine. That's understood. <laughs> I've never hid my hatred for them nor my contempt nor my desire to destroy them. Not in all my life, not now. As a matter of fact, the older I am, the more determined I become to destroy these pigs. Consequently, that they should try to destroy me is only automatic. Indeed, the great son of Africa, Ahmed Sekou Touré says, if the enemy is not doing anything against you, you are not doing anything. Right. Of course. Well, if the FBI ain't doing something against me, I, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> you understand? If the enemy is not haunting me, uh, there's something wrong. Because I'm hunting the enemy. I'm hunting him to kill him because he's messing with my people. You mess with my people, I kill you. Just as quick as that, without even blinking an eye. Matter of fact, I kill you before God get the news. <laughs> no question about it. No question about it. So I understood the FBI should even stick itself. I understood the FBI would follow us. Our policies were quite more revolutionary than Martin Luther King. But would you think that they would tap the phones of Martin Luther King? What is surprising. Uh, not too long ago, I speak to a young brother. He said, hey man, ain't you afraid they won't kill you? <laughs> what makes you think they're not gonna get you before they get me? <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, this has them getting you before they get me. It's more because I'm alert. I know they're trying to get me. <laughs> you think they ain't bugging your phone, but I ain't doing nothing. And... No. The FBI knows 
that I came out of the same conditions that you live in. The FBI know I'm no different from you. <laughs> so the FBI is not afraid of me because of who I am. They're afraid of me because of who you are. <laughs> me by myself, I can't do anything. But us together, why, we can burn 260 sissies in America in a weekend. <laughs> in a weekend. <laughs> yes. So some people think that the FBI only tap the phones of people who are working for the people. You make a big mistake. I will tell you from my travels throughout the world, from my research throughout the world, that the American people are more followed by their government authorities than any people in the world, starting with those in the old Soviet Union. Matter of fact, just your credit card company knows more about you than the government agencies know about its people in other countries. <laughs> American people are totally followed. But they think that the FBI only follows those who the FBI deem to be a threat to the status quo. You make a big mistake. A great big mistake. This is a mistake the king made. Not only did these pigs tap King's phone, but hear me well, they even did these yes, listen, the FBI, such pigs, they will get into your bedroom to cause trouble between you and your wife. You say you love King. Any man in America who tells me they love King must hate the FBI. You can't love God and love the devil at the same time. It's like loving the dollar and loving your people at the same time. I love the people, but I want to make some money. When I make some money, I also help the people. Right. <laughs> I know the line. <laughs> I know the line. <laughs> and as soon as they start making money, they forget about the people. I understand it. It's logical. <laughs> Because you can't make money and help the people. If you want to help the people, there's no money involved here. The only thing involved here is death, torture, and pain. That's all, Jack. The reward is in the doing. If you want money, you can't mess with your people. <laughs> you want money, you can't mess with the rich of your people. If you want money, you've got to bow down to the laws of capitalism. And the first law is that in order for America to remain rich, Africans must be exploited. That's the first law. So oh, we're not confused here. I've never wanted to make money in my life. Make money. What can I do with it? <laughs> never. No. We say anyone who truly loves King must hate the FBI. You know what the FBI did to King? They used to take tapes where he was in other rooms and take these tapes and send them to his wife so she could listen to them. You know what they used to do to me, these pigs, when I was a young man working in Mississippi? They would call my mother at 3 o'clock in the morning and tell her, we got your son, we're going to kill him, we're going to lynch him. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't even tell me about it. It's my sister's room. You know what they call 3 o'clock? Who? She said the Ku Klux Klan. I said it ain't the Ku Klux Klan, it's the FBI. It's the pigs, the FBI. And sure enough, I told my mother, I said, listen, you know, you can cuss nicely. So when they call you three o'clock in the morning, you just say some sweet things about J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> and you know he's a punk. <laughs> I mean, a serious one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a serious one. Oh, you know, one other thing, of course, just a side tangent. But, you know, when we use the word punk, I'm using it only within a cultural sense. And that must be properly understood. Many people in America, Africans in America, get confused. They think that Africans do not have their own culture. They think that our culture is American culture. That's why they're trying to be Afro, African-American, everything except African. That's it, Jack. Just African, nothing else. <laughs> nothing else. Ain't nothing American about me except slavery, exploitation, murder, and the busy personalization. I'm African, Jack, and you can't bring me on no slave plantation and give me part of your nation and tell me that I'm part of you on a plantation. Give me a break. Give me a break. <laughs> African, Jack. Cultures are different, completely different, but you can get confused. I give you one political example, just one. In the 1970s, our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, we are a revolutionary party. Building our cadre to carry out and arrive at our task, which is our objective, which is Pan Africanism, and Pan Africanism is the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. We were conducted by some white left groups in this country who said, well, you know, you say you're revolutionary, we're doing some work, nobody sees you, why don't you come, we're having a meeting. So we said, all right, let's go see what they're talking about. They had some coalition meeting in New York where they were trying to put some great forces together, so we went. The first person to speak was a sister. She came on with tight dungarees, a shirt buttoned up, almost with a tie. 
walked up to the platform and said, the first thing we got to do is we lesbians got to let them know that we're not afraid of them. I listened to it. After a while, I made my little statement. About five minutes, I thanked them and I left. They required, they called us up and said, we've seen no reaction from you. Sir. No, we're not having any from us. They sent one of their representatives to see me, a young white, uh, my old student, probably past student, but very enthusiastic. He went off on me. He said, your party is supposed to be a revolutionary party. Gay rights is an issue. If people are being depopulized, la la la, and you take no standard at all, none whatsoever. I said, that's correct. He said, how can you call yourself revolutionary when these people are suffering, etc., etc.? Everybody is in this. Jeffy Jackson supports us. Marion Barry supports us. I said, they can support you till they die. But me, I'm an African. I know my culture. I stand on it, and no one will confuse me. Not you, Jesse Jackson, or Marion Barry. Look carefully at your culture. Understand properly your culture, otherwise you get confused. The problem of gay rights is a problem of intolerance towards homosexuality. That's all it is. All the gay rights activists are asking for in their community is that they be tolerated, that's all, without discrimination, that's all. If anyone knows the history of Europe, Europe is the most intolerant culture. And if one would just look at the history of Europe and its relationship to homosexuality, all the way from the Greek Empire, one will see nothing but bloodshed here and bashing in affairs. In the African community, you have never heard of any one of us bashing in the head of any homosexual. Bashing in the heads of homosexuals in the African community is as alien as lynching a white man. You must know your culture. I told him, this is not my problem. My problem is not your problem, and we will not confuse each other on each other's problems. Gay rights is certainly a legitimate struggle in the European community because of the intolerance of that culture. But the African community is extremely tolerant. As a matter of fact, we are so tolerant that we ended up here as slaves. <laughs> yes, really tolerant. Do you know that it was the other way around? It was Chief's crazy horse who took a boat and went to England. By the time he got on the shore of England, the English would have shoot him. <laughs> Killed him. <laughs> but these Indians took care of this fool, Columbus, who was lost, didn't know where he was, out of food, sickly, starving. They took care of him, scruffy as he was, fixed him up, sent him back, and he came back to commit genocide against them. And you know, some people are even celebrating 500 years, 500 years of genocide and slavery. The only thing we can celebrate 500 years of the great resistance of the indigenous people of this country. And they do resist. They do resist. My hatred against the FBI spreads in every area. You know, the capitalist system is a racist system. Its job is to inculcate into our minds a racist statement and have us accept these statements without questioning. Of course, if I were to make the statement today in 1992 that Columbus discovered America in 1492, I am sure there were some who will say, well, no, that's not true. He didn't discover it. These people are already here, etc., etc. But by saying that, it has no effect upon the fact that they do accept the racist statement that Columbus discovered America in 1492. Let me give you a clear example. Of course, one of the greatest, greatest crimes an individual and certainly a people can commit is to be ungrateful. Because as a people, we must never be ungrateful. I am willing to bet you that in this room, even though we sit among college students at an institution of higher learning, there are very, very, very few of you, if any of you, that know anything about the United States of America before 1492, or even attempt to find out. <clears throat> That's once they tell you that Columbus has got America in 1492, even if you say no, but you don't do any research before 1492, you've already accepted it by fact and deed even if not by word, but we know there's always contradictions word. If we ask any of you, how many of you love the people? Every hand will go up. How many of you study the people's history every day since you love them? Every hand will go down. We love our people, Brother Kwame. I hear you. <laughs> so we understand clearly these contradictions. Clearly. Africans in America must know about America before 1492. They have to. It is imposed upon them because of the kindness of the indigenous people in this country. When we first came to this country as slaves, we could not escape anywhere because of our beautiful black skins. The only place, the only place, the only place we could find sanctuary in this country was among the indigenous people on the land. 
must not let capitalism give you your history. They cannot give it to you, neither facts nor correct interpretation. They will tell you about Buffalo soldiers. Yes, they were, but that's a minority. If you look properly at the history here, you will see every time we went to the Indians, they took us in, protected us, and mutually respected us, intermarried with us on a completely basis of mutual respect. Some of us even became chiefs of their tribes. I give you only one example so that you can see precisely what I'm speaking of. When the president of the country, Andrew Jackson, that great Indian killer, who followed in the streams of all Indian killers, starting with George Washington, who personified the foundations of American democracy, not only was he an Indian killer, he was also a slave master. So my mama for a barrel of molasses, and I'm supposed to respect him. He combined both of them, slave master and Indian killer. Andrew Jackson was an Indian killer par excellence. In Florida, where the area is swampy, dominated by the Seminoles, Africans, every time they got a chance, ran, and the place they ran to were the swamps of Florida, where it was difficult to catch them. The slave masters put a lot of pressure on Andrew Jackson, and since after all he's going to kill Indians, which he loved very much, he took off enthusiasm for the struggle. He went to Florida. He called the Seminole chief forward. He said, we have no struggle with you at all. All we want is these African slaves who will run away, turn over the African slaves, and we'll leave you alone. The chief looked him square in the eye and said, the blood of these two people are now mixed as one. There's no possible way for me to separate them. They're all my children. Andrew Jackson said, I don't want no nonsense out you now. I'm telling you just like it is, if you don't get rid of these Africans, we're going to war. The chief looked him straight in the eye and said, throw down the tomahawk, let's get it on. <laughs> And if you will look at the history, once again, the Seminoles came to shed their blood to defend our dignity and to defend our freedom. A people can never be ungrateful. A people can never be ungrateful. If we owe allegiance to anybody in this country, it's to the indigenous people of this country. <laughs> to them, we must owe everything. Thus, in this year, when they're talking nonsense about 500 years of Columbus, we must stand shoulder to shoulder with the indigenous people who've been carrying on 500 years of resistance. The FBI, we say, are pigs. That's what they are. Many of you do not even properly understand the role of the FBI in relationship to Indian reservations today. But if you would look legally, they are the police. That's right. On an Indian reservation, the FBI is the police. There is no police there, just the FBI. These are facts. I know you know your country and all that, but you don't know these pigs. We say resistance has been occurring by the indigenous people of this country everywhere. Today, while we speak, some of their greatest warriors sit in jail. One of them, Leonard Peltier. He's been sitting there for 17 years because the FBI invaded a terroristic manner the Wounded Knee Reservation in 1976, shooting up everybody. They killed a man. The Indians defended themselves. Two FBI agents were killed, and Peltier is in jail. Well, you know you killed two, you know, Indians killing two white men. Somebody got to pay. <laughs> we Africans know that. We kill a white man around, at least 10 of us gonna be lynched. Right. We know the history. Today, Leonard Peltier sits in jail. Go and look at the FBI and see the invasion forces that these pigs brought. Helicopters, army tanks, heavy ammunition. For Indians on a reservation where they've already been cooped up. The FBI, they are pigs of pigs, the scum of the human race. I know these pigs, I've struck every step of the way with them, and I'm always one step ahead of them. They followed me for 24 hours daily, with a car. Any house I went to, they would sit outside, waste the taxpayers' money in the wintertime, keep the gas on, and every four hours, you would hear the changing of the guards. When the gas ran out, another car would come, and they would sit there, wasting the people's money tapping all my telephones, and the hunger, the stronger they got behind me, the better I was able to organize. I had been trained in SNCC. When I went to SNCC in a little town in the south there, wherever I went, the first thing the local sheriff would do would follow me everywhere. So I got training from the local pigs for the big pigs. Everything has its positive aspect to it, and you must properly understand it. Of course, dodging 
Ku Klux Klan and Sheriff, which is the same in the South, dodging white citizen councils and police, which is the same in the South, will make you sharp to dodge even FBI agents in the North. We say the Indians in this country everywhere are terrorized by whom? The FBI. Go everywhere. This country, American capitalism, has no shame, none whatsoever. They came and took the Indians, take them off of fertile ground, put them on infertile land, thinking that they would be dependent upon America for food. And after having made them dependent, they come to find out today that this infertile land is militarily rich. And now they come to put them off of that land too. And in the forefront of it always is the FBI. Let it then be clear, as a conscious human being, as a conscious African, never being ungrateful to anyone who's helped my people, I must stand shoulder to shoulder with the indigenous people. So even if I didn't hate the FBI for what they did to me as a human being, I must hate them for what they do to the indigenous people. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The FBI, they've killed Malcolm. The FBI and the CIA and the New York police killed Malcolm X. Of that, there isn't the slightest question. Malcolm X himself said that they tried to make confusion, make it appear as if the Nation of Islam was going to kill Malcolm. But Malcolm knew the Nation of Islam couldn't tap his telephones. The information which the police had, the Nation of Islam couldn't get that. Only the police could get that. Only the police could tap his telephones. Only the police could be able to know and trace his movements as rapidly as they did. The Nation of Islam could not do that. Sir Malcolm was quite clear. The job of the FBI, we say, is to maintain the status quo of American imperialism. And there's no place on, there's no, there's no limit, no limit. Even their budget is unlimited. And they steal, I mean, they steal. And not only do they steal, they are stupid. I tell you this from my own personal contact with them. I worked with them for years, calling them. I used to see them. I said, "This is so stupid. How could he be in the FBI? This is so stupid. He couldn't even. He couldn't even. He couldn't be. A, this one is so stupid. He couldn't even be a slave. And he couldn't even know how to pick cotton. That's how stupid they were. FBI agents. It's a fact. It's a fact. This one too stupid to be a slave. He can't even pick cotton. They were stupid. But the reason why the FBI appears to be successful is because they do whatever they want to do and nobody looks or observes that at them at all. That's why they appear to be so clean and so, because nobody's looking at them. But today, <laughs> since everything changes all the time, everybody is looking at them. And when people begin to look at their past actions, since they never covered it up, because they always thought that people wouldn't look at them, they had trouble trying to cover up their past actions while they carry on their future actions. Today, life is not as rosy for these pigs as it was a few years ago. And we intend to make it less rosy every day. Every day. Every day. We say they're really stupid pigs. I can understand their job. How can anyone accept a job like that? Listening on a telephone to somebody, bugging somebody when they're their wife, writing phony letters. They wrote so many letters. They used to write letters to my wife. I'm sure that a lot of my divorces have to do with these pigs. But <laughs> I didn't do nothing. <laughs> I'm serious. I said, they used to, they write letters to my wife. Used to write letters to my comrades about things I said about my wife. These pigs, listen, I've been fighting with them for a long time. I know that. But they're getting weaker today. Everybody's looking at them today. Congressmen are looking at them today. The masses of people are looking at them today. They're getting weaker. What we have to do is to organize a movement to properly attack them and destroy them. Our party, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, this is 1992, exactly 20 years ago, in 1972, formulated a program entitled Smash the FBI and the CIA. We went to all the left-wing countries, organizations, countries said, listen, let's join our forces and smash the FBI. Of course, I know, as a political activist, that inside every organization, the FBI is to be found. That's their job, and it's, you must expect it. That's to be expected. That shouldn't make you paranoid or even afraid to travel. On the contrary, your job is to scientifically work so you can continue to work while isolating the FBI agents inside your organization. This is the task. 
they infiltrate every organization. That's their job. Because they, how can, and you know, what really got them in trouble was in the 60s, because you know, the FBI is racist. A racist. The job of J. Edgar Hoover, and again, I come back to use the word punk in my cultural sense, because you know, for us Africans, the word punk and the word faggot doesn't have the same connotation it does in the white community. And you shouldn't get confused. Uh, two weeks, three weeks ago in Africa, someone sent me an article on uh, Reverend Al Sharpton. You know who he is, Reverend Al Sharpton? And he, according to him, he made this statement. I looked at it very carefully. He said, uh, I, used to word, I used to use the word punk and faggot a lot, but now that I have an alliance with the NAP, the New Alliance Party, they are training me not to use the word no more. I said, oh, you just shifted your cultural base, Jack. <laughs> you just shifted that base completely. Because in our community, we have no intolerance against homosexualities, none whatsoever. And this is a fact, you must understand it. I want to prove it to you. The hardest organization in our community against homosexuality is the Nation of Islam. You ever heard Brother Farrakhan speak? The minister said, all right, you better straighten up your wrist. <laughs> yes, Farrakhan give him no slack. Malcolm was worse, but James Baldwin was a homosexual, had a profound influence upon the struggle of his people in this country. And James Baldwin was a homosexual and didn't hide it. And Malcolm X praised James Baldwin. Even Minister Louis Farrakhan praises James Baldwin. So you must not be carried away by what appear to be contradictions. We say clearly in the African community we are a tolerant people. So tolerant that any time there's an interracial marriage, they got to live in our community. <laughs> <laughs> and their children will be accepted by no one except us. You must know your culture, and you must not seek to put down your culture to pick up another culture that's useless, worthless, and riddled through with immorality, no values, and racism. You must affirm your culture. The job of the FBI, of course, is to help us in all this confusion. We said in the 1960s, J. Edgar Hoover was caught with his pants down. You know, when the Soviet Union, after World War II, emerged and the communists were getting strength all over the world, J. Edgar Hoover had a trouble, man. His job was to smash the Communist Party. And using a stupid senator, they came to create an atmosphere in America where the Communist Party leaders were running for hiding in this country. I mean, running for cover. Hiding everywhere. They had them so the Communist Party couldn't breathe. By about 1955, I'm sure J. Edgar Hoover sat back put his feet on his desk and said, the job is over. And just as he said that, Rosa Parks sat down. <laughs> <laughs> she just sat down. He just said, everything is over. And she sat down. And from the moment he sat down, that pig never sat down again until he died following the African community and its struggles. He was caught with his pants down. Since he was a racist pig, there were no FBI agents who were African. <laughs> Everything has its positive value. <laughs> so he had to hurry up and train some. <laughs> he had so much contempt for us that he couldn't think that these Africans could even shake the status quo, let alone turn America upside down and put changes upon it in the 60s that will be seen for the rest of its life, no matter how long that is, and it can't be too much longer. He had no respect for us. And so when the movement came up, this pig was caught unaware. There was no way for him to stop it. And believe it or not, the man who gave him the most trouble was Martin Luther King. Not Huey Newton in the Black Panther Party. Not Kwame Ture in the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee, but Martin Luther King. And the reason that Martin Luther King gave them the most trouble was because he thought that he could co-op Martin Luther King. He thought Martin Luther King was just like any of the other leaders. Sooner or later he could be bought out. But Martin Luther King may have made errors in politics, but one error he never made, he loved his people faithfully and honestly. <laughs> yes, Martin Luther King could never compromise. They thought that he could be corrupted, if not materially, at least, Im at least immaterially. But this, too, could not work. Martin Luther King was an honest man. 
And my love for him is founded in this area. We have so many corrupt leaders, so many garbage leaders, that when you find one like Martin Luther King, he shines like a gem in a cesspool. King has to be appreciated. How many pork shop preachers even went out to risk their lives for the people? They drove their Cadillacs everywhere in the South, paying no attention to the people. King risked his life for the people. And King risked his life because of his love for his people. He loved his people. And his people recognized this love, and they loved him. I mean, loved him. I remember when the Mississippi March was coming along. I was walking arm in arm with King. We came to a little town. All these old peasants, these old cotton pickers, hard workers had heard King was coming. They left the fields and came to Stanley Road. When we came down, I heard one said, there he is. That's all I heard. Next thing, they were stepping all over me. That's all. And I heard one jump up and said, oh, Lord, I touched the hem of his garment. <laughs> these people loved King. I remember very well on that march. When we started, there were problems with nonviolence with King. We're nonviolent on this march, Dr. King. There's no problem here. But the very first day of the march, I'll never forget it. We were walking. <clears throat> Dr. King was on my right. He had my arms hooked. I can't remember who was on my left. Somebody else. This great old beefy, honky, redneck cop, state trooper. You know, they always pick on big so you could be intimidated. Came walking fast. I thought he was coming for me because I'm the one making the noise. So I threw my chest out as hard as I could, hoping that when he touched me, he'd break his wrist. <laughs> but this pig passed right by me and went and pushed King. I couldn't even believe it. What? They cut King? King was grabbing my arm. I was trying to get my arm out to get to that pig. And I was launching. King said, everybody grabbed him. They all grabbed me. Well, you know, it was a march between SNCC and SCLC and some other organizations. And, of course, we had competition all the time, the two of us, these two organizations. But don't get confused. When we face the enemy, we face the enemy as one. And we wouldn't hesitate to take a bullet for each other at any time. Snake people tell me, you made a big mistake. You violated nonviolence. And, you know, after the march at night, we'd have meetings. And then we'd criticize each other. Seriously, you know, if SCLC made a mistake, we'd crucify them. And if we made a mistake, they'd crucify us. And all through the march, always going through my head is tonight, they're going to give us some trouble. <laughs> when the meeting came at night, not one SCLC staffer raised the issue. King was the only one who raised it. He said, you know, uh, Kwame, you said we have a nonviolent march, and uh, you know, you are just no longer a sneak field secretary. You're the leader of the organization now, and uh, your actions are not what they used to be. They're all out of proportion to your individual personality. So your actions must be clear. He spoke. I knew I was incorrect. When he was finished, I told him, I said, Dr. King, I promise you one thing. You know me. I've always been nonviolent, and if I've ever broken nonviolent discipline, it's been this time. I said, you can tell, because he used to, we used to laugh at him, how he used to call the, who was the Attorney General, the Katzenbach? Or, I can't remember, but you know, he used to call them. He said, him, you call your little uh, white boy up there, and you tell him that if he wants this march nonviolent, I promise him, he can, they can brutalize anybody they want on this march, starting with me. I'll be nonviolent. But if they touch you, nonviolence is over. That's exactly what I told him. And when he died on April 4th, I knew what my job was. <laughs> I knew precisely what it was. Nonviolence would be over this day, here and now. They'll know it. Everybody who we have contact with, start burning the cities. Let them know we ain't playing this. The people bury King. The people don't make the mistakes the King made. King made a mistake. King makes the same mistake that Mandela makes. The same mistake that Albert Lithuli makes. They're all good people and we love them because they're honest, they're full of integrity. But they make a great error. Their error is they do not properly understand the level of human quality of the enemy at the given moment. <laughs> but the people know the level of human quality of the enemy because the people deal with them every day. So why we love King and we applaud for him and we appreciate him, we follow him. When he says nonviolence always, we just look at him nicely. Nice. You know he means well. <laughs> but get the guns. <laughs> get them. And this can be seen everywhere. If you look at the history of Martin Luther King, when he was in Montgomery, Alabama, he swore nonviolence. They dynamited his house. When they dynamited his house, he talked nonviolence. Uh, the people came and told him, hey, you sit down. We're putting bodyguards around your house. King said, well, you know, you don't know nothing about this one, Dr. King. You can lead us, but we're going to take care of you. We're putting bodyguards around your house. And bodyguards were put around the house of Martin Luther King in Montgomery, Alabama, as early as 1956. The people don't play. When the leaders make errors and they love their leaders, they'll protect the leaders. 
And King's era of making believe that nonviolence should be a principle used at all times was never accepted by the masses of the people, never. And his death clearly showed that. You must not think that these people didn't love King. On the contrary, it is because of their love of King that they're able to carry on the actions they did to bury him properly like a gorilla should be buried with fires burning everywhere in the camps of the enemy. The FBI killed Martin Luther King. We said J. Edgar Hoover had great deals of problems. He wasn't even thinking about Rosa Parks. He didn't even know who she was. He couldn't think that these Africans could rise up and burn down the cities. These Africans could rise up and cause casualties in America. These Africans could cause America to change their policies because of the relationship outside the world in their struggle with what they call the Cold War and the USSR. He never even envisioned that. These little Africans be serious. But the people, the almighty people, they will always shock the enemy because the enemy can never know the people. This is a fact. Go and you will see. When J. Edgar Hoover killed Martin Luther King, that pig had arranged for us to have meetings all over the country in churches. They had it prepared. <laughs> churches? Ain't nobody going to church today, Jack. <laughs> I remember James Brown. He got that pit. I'm dead. Let's just shoot him. He got down. He said, I ain't in it. <laughs> what? Listen, when the people rise up in rage, if you ain't with them, you better be cool. Don't get in their path because they will walk over you. They will walk over you. We said the FBI killed King. Jack Hoover had a real problem. He had just quashed the Communist Party, finished all that, had everything under control, and now these Africans are screaming. And not only King, but King is now producing others like Snake and the Black Panthers, etc., etc. They have to be stopped. It's clear. You must understand that I understand in revolution there is no sentimentality. The FBI seeking to shoot me just as natural as me. She's seeking to shoot them. That's all. And no need for sentiment in it. I have a position which is opposed to their position, they have a position which is opposed to my position, and two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. <laughs> so there's no sentimentality here. Revolution is scientific, never emotional. It has its own laws, just like everything under the sun, indeed, including the sun. Of course. This because we don't know it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The laws to go to the moon were here since man and woman first came on the face of the earth. We just came to find them out a couple of years ago, but they were here. The laws governing social behavior is here in a capitalist system. They don't even direct you, direct your attention there because they tell you, oh, you know, you can't control human behavior. It's so unpredictable, so don't try to put laws on human behavior. Garbage. There's laws on everything. Even human development itself has its own unfurling laws, just like everything in life. Hmm? FBI J. Edgar Hoover had a decision. I have to kill these Africans. I have to kill their leaders. They're making too much trouble. But J. Edgar Hoover is a political man. He's not just a cold-blooded assassin. No. When the FBI and the CIA kill, it is properly planned. It's a political decision. It's always a political decision. This man, Lumumba, they told Kennedy, they told Eisenhower, this man, Lumumba, is making a lot of trouble in the Congo. If we don't get rid of him, our interests are in trouble. So Eisenhower says, get rid of him. It's not, there's nothing sentimental about it. You don't even know Lumumba. <coughs> So you mustn't think that in these struggles there is sentimental hatred. No, 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 the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover is a cold-blooded assassinator. But he's not emotional at all. He has to make clear political decisions. He has to kill him, so he has to kill. But here's his problem. He doesn't have to worry about the right, the NAACP, and the Urban League. His trouble is King and to the left. Why is King his trouble? King, we said, is his trouble because they thought in the beginning that King was just a simple pork chop preacher. And they thought, certainly they can give them pork chop and he'd sit down after a while. <laughs> That's just what they thought. That's just what they just like they do to all the others. You know, some they don't even give pork chop, they let them smell it and they sit down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what makes me mad with our reactionaries is they sell out our people for nothing. I mean, what makes me mad about Africa is the skull of our race who rules our country, sell our countries for Mercedes. These pigs don't know the value of a diamond. They know nothing. They find a diamond. They go to the white man. The white man says, oh, good. I'll give you Mercedes. Mercedes? Yes, you are. Diamond is worth one million dollars. They sell us cheap, you know. Me, if I ever sell my people, I promise you, I'll sell them for a high price because I know the value of my people. <laughs> I do. <laughs> How about uh, $300,000? Okay, you can use that to call me with. <laughs> sell my people for jump change? Be serious. But they do it all the time. 
So since King wasn't one of those chump change preachers, and they gave him a lot of publicity, being sure they'd be able to control him, gave him the Nobel Prize, being sure they'd be able to control him, but the more they gave him, the less he was able to be controlled, and the more publicity they gave him among the masses, and the more the masses loved him. So because of them and their error, they came to put King squarely in the face and the center of the movement, and everybody loved King. Say, so Goob, I had to kill somebody, so he said, all right, if we start on the left with Snick and the Black Panther Party, since Martin Luther King is an honest man, when we kill and the community get mad, King will move to the left. Their team is clearly from the Black Power March in Mississippi. Matter of fact, at the end of the Black Power March, King was closer to Snick and closer to the core than he was to NAACP and Urban League. And by the time we got through with him, he was a major force against the war in Vietnam. Let me make it clear to you. SELC was not the first organization to attack the Vietnam War. It was a student nonviolent coordinating committee. We did it by ourselves and were isolated. And when we had our meetings, oh, we in trouble. We by ourselves. We take them on. I said, no, we're not going to take them on by ourselves. King going to take them on. King going to take them on? Yeah, King going to take them on. We're going to make King take them on. And we worked out a player program for King. Nonviolent, full of love. Every time you see King, pose the contradictions to him about his position of nonviolence in America and supporting violence in Vietnam. I remember one night in Chicago, I was there and I heard King was there. Oh, and you know, Dr. King was like all of Claire African men had appreciation for all beautiful things. <laughs> and I went to see him with some nice beautiful things. It was one o'clock in the morning. And we sat down, I said, oh, I haven't seen him for a long time. I said, oh, Dr. King, these two young sisters have been dying to meet you. If they don't meet you, they'll kill me. So we met them, sat down, we talked a little while. I said, Dr. King, you remember, uh, what was that brother's name? Uh, oh, okay. Do you remember Frank Hughes? He said, Frank Hughes. Frank Hughes said, yeah, Dr. King, remember that's his brother down in Mississippi? The little, oh, yeah, I remember him. Call me what happened. Where? I haven't seen him a long time. Where is he? I said, you remember how he joined the movement? You gave him so much advice on nonviolence? Because he was a little rough brother, lumping proletariat. Couldn't believe in nonviolence. The King himself sat the brother down, talked to him. Brother got convinced. I said, you remember King? said, yes. Yeah. where is he? Call me. I said, Dr. King, he's dead. He's dead. What happened to him? Well, he got shot in Vietnam. In Vietnam? Yeah, Dr. King, I guess your nonviolence didn't go far enough to Vietnam. Or maybe it did. Maybe he just put his gun down and let the Vietnamese shoot him. Hitting him hard without pity and without mercy. But Dr. King, that's your policy. You tell us to be nonviolent here, not to be nonviolent in Vietnam. That's what you get. We knew that the forces of the FBI, through all sorts of infiltration, were trying to stop King from taking the correct position. Telling him that, you know, this is not domestic matter, you shouldn't get involved in this international matter. The political problem for King was clear. Once he came out against the war in Vietnam, he must come out against the federal government. King, we say, was an honest man. And that's why we will always love him, because what our people need more than anything else throughout the world is just honest men and women who truly represent their interests. That is all that we need, nothing else. King knew precisely that when he did it. But King, oh, King, generations will praise you. They don't know you yet. They will come to know you. King was a man who could come to criticize himself publicly without the slightest fear. The American capitalist system job is to confuse us, so they give you, I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream is his greatest speech. Anybody knowing King knows that the I have a dream speech is one of his most mediocre speeches. Anybody knowing King? But some people don't even know King. They don't even know the speech. All those, I have a dream. <laughs> American capitalist system can give you the most shallow understanding of history. The most shallow. Most people in America know Nelson Mandela. They don't even know who the ANC is. We won't even talk about the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. <laughs> they will give you a shallow understanding. Dr. King recognized he made an error. And when he came to criticize himself in his speech against the war in Vietnam, which is one of his best speeches, but they won't play that one for you. <laughs> but if you really love your people, I recommend that you go and listen to that speech. Even if you can't read and don't like reading, it's on a record. And if you can listen to rap, ain't nobody can rap like King. I'll tell you the truth, it's not. One time I remember in Sunday, King invited me, he said, uh, I called me up in his Atlanta Saturday, he said, uh, call me what you're doing tomorrow. I said, oh, tomorrow Sunday. Oh, Dr. King, I said, I have a lot of work to do. He said, you're not going to the Lord's house? I said, oh, the Lord has to forgive me, you know. But I'm just immortal. I'm not like him. He can work six days and rest on seven. I got to work all seven. <laughs> he said, well, I want you to come to my church tomorrow. I said, well, Dr. King, we have a lot of work. He said, well, uh, 
I'm preaching tomorrow. I said, well, Dr. King, in that case, I'll definitely come. Because even if I don't believe in your Jesus, when you preach, I got to tap my feet. That's the reason King can rob. If you were listening to this speech, King, when criticizing himself, said, there's a point where caution can become cowardice. And he was speaking about himself. And when he came to speak, he recognized precisely what the problem was. It was against the American government. And his statement was, my government is the perpetrator of the most terroristic crimes in the world today. He said it. The die was cast here, Jack, if others didn't know it. Even we ourselves in Sticks said, uh-oh, we pushed King, but now he's going to the brink. I myself didn't think he would go that far, but King was an honest man. When he saw he made an error, he corrected it. The Chinese say if you make an error, you know it's an error, you don't correct your error, you've made your second error. King never made this error, he corrected it completely. King went after the American government and mobilized people against the war in Vietnam till he came to occupy the center stage against the war in Vietnam. Here, J. Edgar Hoover was really in trouble. Yeah, he was trying just to stop the Africans in America, and now they jumped to Vietnam. <laughs> These little cotton-picking people gonna talk about international policy against the government? You know that racist pig was steaming. He had to kill now, there was no question about it. And not only that, we used the cover of King, the student now by the Coalition Committee, to attack the draft. King was talking about peace, we're talking about destroy the draft, Jack. That's their machinery to send us there, destroy it. And we destroyed it. Destroyed it, of course. <laughs> Uh, enemy is only as big as you imagine him to be. Once you start fighting with him, you see he's just, just like you, just another man making errors and can fall. Yeah. All the people who you will find in our community who tell you, you know, if you're a radical, the FBI will get you, and this will be, they're ones who've never fought the enemy. They look at television, they think the enemy is just, you know, just the FBI. They can just get, find anything. Oh, I knew they were chumps. I knew they were chumps from the beginning. Four children were dynamited in Birmingham, Alabama. And the FBI didn't find them until two years ago when pressure was put on them. <laughs> FBI, <laughs> you can tell everybody, but I know you couldn't do nothing. You, could, you know why they couldn't find them? Because the FBI and the Ku Klux Klan and the Mafia is one and the same. I'm telling you the truth. Don't take my word for it, go and take their word. The CIA, the real scum, they themselves have admitted that they have themselves formed alliance with the Mafia to try and assassinate Fidel Castro so many times. They've said it, not me. They've admitted it. Like they can touch Fidel. Fidel Castro is a great man. From Bush, from George Washington to George Bush, they will never find any president as loved as Fidel Castro is throughout the world. Fidel Castro is respected. They themselves try to assassinate him. For what? Because he says simply, this is the way I want to run my country. I don't want none of your fascist democracy. Like America can give democracy to somebody bathed in genocide and slavery. You're going to give democracy to somebody. Come on, be serious. You can't give democracy to a dog. You can't give it to me. I built your country and you shoot me in the street like a dog. And you come to tell me about you're going to give somebody democracy? But they don't even know how to spell it. You see, J. Edgar Hoover was in serious problem. He had to kill. But how to kill? If he started on the left, since King was an honest man and the people would get angry, King would move to the left. And when King moved to the left, he would move the entire people to the left. There was no question here. Therefore, a cold, calculated decision was made. Kill King first. It's like we say now, you must not get sentimental. King himself knows the position he occupies, just like any conscious man fighting a war knows, just like any soldier in Vietnam. Jesus said to me, weren't you afraid when you were to, to uh, 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 Mississippi at 18 years old, 19 years old? I said, well, if I didn't go, I'd be in Vietnam. <laughs> I don't see the difference in terms of the danger. Only difference, of course, I'm not going to be no mercenary for nobody, that's for sure. I only fight for my people. I decided a long time ago, my blood belongs to my people, nobody else. Nobody else. American imperialism will never get this one. Go fight in Vietnam, Baghdad, Baghdad, I don't even know the place. <laughs> Go fight where? No, Jack, I don't know Saddam Hussein. I don't even speak Arabic, so if he insults me, I don't know, but I know English. <laughs> All right.
And I knows who insults me. <laughs> and I knows even the names they call me. <laughs> so I'm not confused. I knows who my enemy is, and it is the FBI and the CIA. So they killed King. Ah, uh, but as Sekou Toure says, imperialism will never know the people. Kill when they kill King, I said. J. Edgar Hoover and them had planned all sorts of memorial services. They were sure the people were going to be non-violent. They were going to sit down in the t three minutes after they killed King on the telephone. They were talking about, we got to be non-violent. I said, who's talking? I said, hang up the phone. Non-violence is over, Jack. All the contacts we have throughout this country, tell them, stop burning. Non-stop burn. Let them know, Jack, that if they touch to the left of King, they're going to see what they get because King is talking about non-violence, we burn it. They touch somebody talking about violence and we really show them something. They killed King. There's no question about it. The FBI killed King. The FBI will be smashed. Of that, there isn't the slightest issue. The CIA will be smashed. Of that, there isn't the slightest issue. American imperialism everywhere is in serious trouble. As a matter of fact, everyone knows what George Bush knows. The United Nations is the best that the American dollar can buy. <laughs> Just like all America's friends, look around the world. All American's friends are the best the American dollar can buy. When the American dollar falls, America will have nothing but enemies. Nothing but enemies. Indeed, the FBI, one of its secrets arm was its unlimited budget. It could bribe people, pay informers. Oh, they could do everything with money. But money cannot buy conscious men. Money cannot even come near conscious women. My grandmother used to tell me a long time ago, she said, son, if you have a friend and you try to buy him, you'll have an enemy. Everyone knows you can't buy friends, you can only buy enemies. <laughs> Bush doesn't seem to know this. He thinks the one he buys, they really like him. <laughs> he thinks like a slave master believes that all her cotton-picking, grinning from air to air slaves really, really love her and will die for her. None of them will burn her plantation. <laughs> Some of us are crazy, we do burn. <laughs> Bush is in serious trouble. The American capital system is in serious trouble. And the FBI shows this contradiction most of all. Look and you will see. Even CIA agents now have to quit the CIA and come before the people and tell the truth about the CIA. <laughs> Look everywhere, you will see it. When in 1966 we sent the CIA overthrew Nkrumah, we had no facts. People said, oh, you know, they're always saying something, but today nobody can say that. Even Stockwell in his book gives the proofs, names the agents who instruments him in overthrowing Kwame Nkrumah. The CIA has a history throughout the world that is hated by people. Hated everywhere, and this righteous hatred. The people in America must understand what their responsibility is. The government, which speaks in their name, creates hatred for them all over the world. You think that Bush thinks he has a victory in Baghdad? It's nothing but a failure. Throughout the world, the hatred for America is astonishing. I live in Africa. Where I live, there are many reactionary forces. I mean reactionary. And I was surprised during the war and after the war when I go to talk to some of these reactionary forces, the insults they would heap on America made me sound like an Uncle Tom. <laughs> how could they, how would they ask me, how is it possible for him to go and kill all these children who have done nothing to him? Say he's going there for Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein is still alive. He ain't doing nothing to him. How could he justify that? The American capitalist system has a logic of its own. And those Africans who don't think but just follow unconsciously follow that logic, but not everybody follows the logic. They are laughing because the Soviet Union is falling apart. They're having a great, great hurrah. You know what the people say outside America? Gorbachev is a fool. When he had socialism, he had a strong country, was respected and even feared by America. He was helping everybody. Today he's got a tin pan begging America for money because he gave up socialism. The facts are clear. <laughs> you must not think there's only one side to every story. There are always two sides to every story. And you must not think your side is the only side. There's always the other side. Of course, one of the tricks of American capitalism in giving education is that it gives only a one-sided view of reality. <laughs> you look at television, 
You hear only about the cowboys, nothing about the Indians. You listen to these Zionist pigs, you hear nothing about Israel, nothing about the Palestinians. Matter of fact, Golda Meir said, they don't even exist. <laughs> she said it. They don't even exist. <laughs> You're always one side, never the other side, but life is a dialectic world. There's always two sides to every aspect of life. If you love, you have the capacity to hate. If you do not have the capacity to hate, you cannot have the capacity to love. If you have the capacity to cheat as a student, believe it or not, you also have the capacity to be an honest student, not to cheat. <laughs> and if you can cheat, you cannot cheat. If you cannot cheat, you can also cheat. You must not get confused in life at all. Everything has two sides. American capitalism isolates things to make it look as if things just happen isolated. So you, Hitler, Hitler was this. Everybody in this room can be a Hitler. And if you don't think you can be a Hitler, you're stupid. Hitler was produced by conditions. Given the same conditions, you too might be even worse than Hitler. To isolate people and make them look as if they're fools is all even part and parcel of the FBI. The real struggle with the FBI is not only in the physical domain, but in the in the ideological domain. The FBI used to have people here confused. American people were against communism, didn't even know what it was. Didn't even try to understand. And they're still lying. George Bush is the biggest liar in the world. Now, I don't say that like others without proof. I give you proof. Just even three weeks ago, three weeks ago, it's recent three weeks ago, I heard this pig stand up before the people of America said, well, now that communism is over, we have to see. Communism is over. He works for the CIA. He said, you know, one thing, once you work for an intelligence agency in a country, you always work for them. There ain't no such thing as ex-CIA director. <laughs> Matter of fact, you'd be like Casey. You get ready to talk. They put you to death the night before you speak, just like in the, just, just like in the detective stories. <laughs> and people won't even say that. I see that. The man was supposed to testify on Monday. They killed him on Sunday. <laughs> Nobody said anything. I said, wow, this is really amazing. <laughs> ain't no such thing as no ex-director of the CIA. You know too much. You can't be ex. Bush is a CIA director. Bush knows that there's no communist state in the world. He knows it. Not one. Nobody in this room can show me one state that claims communism. Fidel Castro claims socialism. Kim Il-sung in the Republic of uh, Korea, what they call North Korea, claims socialism. The Chinese under Mao Zedong and Sins claim socialism. The Soviet Union was called USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And they wanted to be communist. They wanted to be. So I'm sure as soon as they came, they'd be the first to change their name to the USCR, Union of Soviet Communist Republics. No communist country in the world. All of them claim socialism. But Bush had the people so fooled that they really think communism fell. We say the area is a real struggle in ideology. Look at what these pigs are doing. Me, I'm a socialist. Me, I am a socialist. Uh -huh. And American capitalism can never confuse me. They have their two missing, oh, socialism is finished. Oh, socialism has collapsed. <laughs> you never judge a system by its adherence. You judge it only by its principles. Who in this room judges Christianity by Christians? <laughs> Indeed, were we to judge Christianity by Christians, it crumbled with Judas. A the level of human quality throughout the world is rife with corruption. People betray Christianity just like they betray Islam, just like they betray socialism. But we do not judge Islam, Christianity, or socialism like, by its betrayers like Gorbachev. It is judged only by its principles. And just like when Judas betrayed Jesus Christ, the principles of Christianity remain intact. Betrayals by every socialist will not touch the principles of socialism. They remain intact. So the capitalist system will do everything to confuse you. There are only two economic systems in the world, capitalism or socialism. Just two. Just two. And there can only be two. Every economic system must answer one fundamental question. Who will own and control the wealth of the country? <clears throat> Who will own and control the means of production? The question can only be answered two ways. Either a few will own or everybody will own. It's as simple as that. 
There's no question that socialism is the inevitable system that will sweep the world. It's the only just system. And human beings, they fight for justice. I mean, they fight for justice. Like Dr. Martin Luther King said, they make a way out of no way. They fight for freedom. And they will continue to fight and they will arrive at it. The job of the FBI is to destabilize fighting forces. I tell you, they're my enemy. I was the chairperson of the Student Nonviolent Corner Committee. I was the honorary chairman of the Black Panther Party at the time when the FBI wrecked havoc on us. I know these pigs. I know them well. But I promise them as Africa is my mother, they shall be buried in the ground before the wrath of the righteousness of the people. I only hope I'm alive so that I can be in the front lines walking over their chest. But I promise you, like the Honorable Marcus Garvey, if I'm dead, when March comes to the FBI, I'm coming out the grave to help me. <laughs> Our concluding remarks are clear. The FBI cannot be destroyed unless there is proper organization. Because the FBI, they're organized. The FBI is so organized that if they want to put out a rumor on you, all they do is sit down in one office, put it out, fax it to the rest of them. Within one hour, that rumor is all over the country. I know that. In fact, I used to wonder sometimes. They put out rumors on me. Oh, wherever you went, well, it's easy. Oh, the FBI, they just put it out. There's their forces. Their forces got informers in every organization. They call up the informer. This is a new rumor. And before you get there, the rumor is there. Rumor mongering, these pigs are specialities at it. Causing confusion, they know it best. We said the only way they can be destroyed is through organization. The African masses in this country must be organized. Even if they don't want to destroy the FBI, they must be organized because it's only through organization that they will advance their struggle. It is clear here. We started off by demonstrating our history in this country. We say for everything we get in this country, even individual advancements, we must shed our blood. It doesn't make sense to me that to get to five and ten cent store, you shed your blood. To get to school, you shed your blood. To get the vote, you shed your blood. To sit on a bus where you want to, you shed your blood. To, no. Since we got to shed our blood for everything we get in this country, just for reform, hear me well. Understand me properly. We've not been shedding our blood for revolution. We've been shedding our blood for reform. Have you ever heard that? And they call America a democratic country. Me, I have to shed my blood for reform. Usually, you shed your blood for revolution. Not for reform. But all we've been making reform. And just for reforms, we've got to shed our blood. So if you're shedding your blood here, there, isolated for reforms, logically, it makes sense that we get together, organize ourselves, make revolution, shed our blood one time, and be free. The logic is clear. In our final statements, we must impose upon you the necessity to play a crucial role in your people's struggle. We have said that if your people are oppressed and you're not helping the people, you're against the people. That's a fact. There's no discussion here. The only way you can help your people is by being in an organization. The FBI is a powerful organization. Powerful. But it will be brought down by the righteousness of the organization of the African masses and those who love justice in this country. You must organize. I organize for the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Ours is a revolutionary party. We're against capitalism and we're out to smash the FBI and the CIA. We've told them that we're going to do it. we we'll smash them. They've got so much trouble today, they can hardly breathe, and we're going to give them more trouble. It's like this big bush talking about he's going to bomb Africa again. You know, most Africans in this country don't even know Libya is in Africa. I'm talking about college students. They're the most advanced country in the world. Give me a break. They don't even know Libya's in Africa. Libya's in Africa. And Bush called to the war. You see what this pig did with Reagan? Took some airplanes, just like the Ku Klux Klan. It's the same mentality. The Ku Klux Klan will come and get you. You know when they come get us? When we sleep at night. Any sensible man would be in bed with his wife, but these punks who can't sleep with their wives get up at 2 o'clock in the morning, put sheets on their head, and come throw hand grenades in your room and say they're fighting war. <laughs> Could you imagine me 2 o'clock in the morning putting on a sheet on my face? Come on, uh, and I'm a married man. <laughs> <laughs> there must be something about that frustration thing there. <laughs> Come to 
2 o'clock in the morning, burned your houses right away and said they had a war and a victory. Reagan and Bush takes planes from London, go all the way down, halfway around the world, drop bombs on Libya for eight minutes, destroying wrecking and havoc at 3 o'clock in the morning when the people are sleeping, fly away, and Reagan says, we waged the war and we won. And now they say they want to do it again. The only way we can stop them is to let Bush see what the real conditions are in this country. Keep this pig so busy in America, he won't have time to breathe outside of America. And the people who can do that best is the African masses in America. Because they always underestimate us, just like J. Edgar Hoover did when Rosa Parks sat down. The only way you can be of service to your people is by being in an organization. I was a revolutionary, so if you want to join a revolutionary organization, and by revolutionary I mean uncompromising, by revolutionary I mean a one that will continue along the path without the slightest hesitation, by revolutionary I mean one that is totally alienated from every aspect of life of capitalism, starting with its values, one who wants no part of capitalism and cannot be bought by capitalism and all the money in the world cannot deter us from our just cause. This is a revolutionary party. One that's been stealing revolution, a pan-Africanist party. We do not just have Africans in Pittsburgh, Africans in Delaware in our party. We have Africans all over the world in our party. We have chapters of our party throughout the world, in Africa in the Caribbean, in South and Central America, in America, in Europe, where Africans are to be found. Charles is a clear revolutionary party. We would like you to join our party, but we tell you now, a serious party, a serious party. When you join our party for the first six months, you see, we are, we are all African people's revolutionary party. We know our people, and we base our work on our people's culture. And since we are concerned about our people, we want to strengthen the weaknesses of our people. Some people who say they're for the people don't look at the weaknesses. They look at the strong points, play on the strong points, and then applaud themselves. Let me give you an example. One of the weaknesses of our people in struggle is that we are quick to mobilize. I mean, we can mobilize in a minute, Jack. If on this campus, as we said earlier, a white student slaps a sister, I promise you, for the next two weeks, every African on this campus will be hot. They got picked. Let's, let's take over the administration system. This is too much. We got to do something. For two weeks, they'll be hot. And after that, they're going to sit down <laughs> and wait until another sister gets out. And then after that, they will sit down and wait until another. This is a weakness. But our, our ability to mobilize, some people who say they're organizers in our community have no understanding. Because just because the people can be quickly mobilized, it's not your job to mobilize them about anything and let them sit down. As a matter of fact, that's hurting the movement. Nobody can win a war jumping up and sitting down, jumping up and sitting down. When you fight a war, you do like the rest to say. You get up and you stay up. But our people have no staying power. We have no staying power. Oh, we, we're rough for a minute, boy. We can, matter of fact, we're the only people in the world can face American imperialism, rise up in one weekend, burn down 269 cities, and sit down for 20 years. <laughs> Nobody else but us. Once you start burning, you got to keep on burning till you arrive at your liberation. What we lack is organization to continue us, to give us, the co to give us the continual power through a cohesive force. We lack the cohesive force. The cohesive force is given to us only by provocative actions of the enemy. This is sheer stupidity. I should say, the only time we fight is when the enemy shoot one of us. And the only time we get is when they shoot one too many. Sometimes shoot one, blah, 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 we don't do nothing. Blah, blah, blah. But sometimes, oh no, it's too much now, he shot one too many. Let's burn. As a people, we must not be reacting to the enemy. We must sit down, clearly plan our attacks offensively against the enemy. You hear the people talking about, oh, I thought everything was all right in the 60s, but now when you look in the 90s, they're just raising their ugly heads again. Racism is everywhere. People who are talking that know nothing. They should shut their mouth up. There's enough ignorance in our community. They don't need to spread more. The only time this monster is held in check is when there's mass mobilization in our community. 
So if you want to keep the monastery in check, you have to have mass mobilization all the time. Did you understand me? Right. The minute your mass mobilization is down, you must be a fool to think the enemy is going to run away. Matter of fact, when he see you get up, he says, oh, those savages, they're just uprising. Get back, leave them in a while, and in a couple of days, they'll sit down. And then they sit back down, and then he comes back. And when he comes back, you'd be a fool to think he'll let you stay where you are. He's going to push you all the way back. This is logic of law. It's a war. That's the way wars are fought. We must be able to have permanent organizations which attack the enemy all the time, and we must now force the enemy to react to our provocation. This can only be done through organization. In final summation, then, we tell you you must be organized. If you don't join our party, and if you're interested, our brother in the back, serious, conscious African, take your name, tell you about our party, process, but only tell you one thing about our party. Since our people are, have weak areas, we seek to strengthen them. We've given you one of the weak areas, mobilization, which is temporary and spontaneous response to the enemy and not continual attacks, weakness. One of the biggest weaknesses we have as a people is that we don't read. I mean, we just don't read. You come to this college campus, these Africans on this campus are the best dancers on the campus, they dance all the time. <laughs> Worst readers, they never read. When you care about a people, you must strengthen their weaknesses. If you say you love your people, you must strengthen your weaknesses that you have so you could be stronger and a more effective fighter for the people. Do you know that our people don't read so much and because they don't read, they know nothing? Like even Christians, Jack, call themselves Christians, they don't even read the Bible. <laughs> I met a sister the other day, said she was a deacon in a church, just jumping off. Are you a Christian? Yeah. What do you think about Africa? Africa? Are you a Christian? Uh, you're a Christian? <laughs> any Christian. Any Christian. And I assume that if you say you're Christian and you can read, at least you've read the Bible. Come, come, come. If you're a Christian and you can read and you ain't read the Bible, you're a stupid Christian. <laughs> if you read the Bible, any Christian, you have to appreciate Africa. When Jesus Christ was in trouble as a youth and everybody wanted to kill him, who protected him? Africa. Where did he find refuge? Africa. Who trained him spiritually, intellectually, and morally? Africa. First country mentioned in the Bible, Genesis 2, verse 13, Ethiopia. Might be called Cush, but you know Cush is the ancient name for Ethiopia. Europe is not mentioned in the Bible till near the very end by revelations. These are facts. The first church in the world comes out of Africa. The first monastery in the world comes out of Africa. The very intellectual development of the church comes out of Alexandria, which is in Egypt, which still is in Africa. I say any Christian who doesn't appreciate Africa is not a Christian at all. What Africa has done for Christianity, even the most racist pig Christian must bow down before. <laughs> so it is when you don't know your history, you get confused. But you know, some of us don't even begin, we begin our history in 1619. <laughs> 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 don't even go back. Well, I'm an American. You know, no, no. You can never begin your history in the arms of your enemy. All you'll have is your enemy's rendition of your history. Any people who are enslaved, <laughs> fighting to be free, cannot begin their struggle <coughs> in the point of their capture, no. They must go back to when they were free. Right. To give them inspiration, to push them to fight for a higher qualified level of freedom. Consequently, any African in America seeking to find the truth about situation must begin the history, not in 1619, not on a slave ship, but in Africa. If they don't begin in Africa, they are lost from the beginning. They will end up as good slaves. If you would just look at your history, you would not get confusion. The other day, at a discussion, I saw that I'm anti-Zionist. Me, I'm anti-Zionist, Jack. To the max. They say, you know George Bush just fought hard to have them change this uh, resolution from the UN and say that Zionism is not racism? Man, I said, what do you think about that? That ain't no problem. If Zionism is not racism, George Bush is not a racist. <laughs> But whom you're playing with, of course, he by the UN and those punks sign up and say that uh, it's not, it's racist. Zionism, as racist as you can get. So I was saying I was anti-racist. A little student 
a Zionist student jumped up and said, Are well, you anti-Semitic and you anti-Judaic? Me? Anti-Semitic and anti-Judaic? Never. Anti-Zionist? Always. I can never be anti-Semitic. Not me. I support the PLO. I give them unconditional support. I love Arafat. And Arafat is a Semite. They will confuse you. Me, I support the Palestinians as Semites. Gold in my ear is no Semite. Perez is not a Semite, he's a Cossacoid. Nobody gets confused here. They use words and confuse you. They say, you anti-Judaic. Me, anti-Judaic? I'm a conscious African, Jack. I'm proud of Africa. And I know Africa gave Judaism to the world. I can never be against that. <laughs> if you don't know your history, they will confuse you. Africa gave monotheism, belief in one God, to the world. And if you take a cursory look at Africa, when Africa was practicing belief in one God, all around Africa they were doing everything else except that. To the east of Africa, they were worshipping the sun. To the north of Africa, in Palestine, they were worshipping idols and will continue to do so until the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his name, came along in the 6th century A.D. to civilize them. These are facts. That's why Judaism had to be born in Africa. It was only in Africa that it could be nourished because it was only in Africa that there was belief in one God, monotheism. Even in the Bible, if you will read it, Christians. <laughs> well, you know, these Christians want to get their Bible teaching off the television these days. <laughs> it's everything off the television, yes, sir. <laughs> If you would read your Bible, it tells you that Moses married an Ethiopian woman by the name of Hannah. If you don't know nothing, one thing you must know, anytime an African mates with any other offspring, the black gene is the dominant gene. <laughs> so I know that Moses' children through Hannah had to look a little bit African. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> you know, just maybe some frizzly hair, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> To me, I'm not confused at all. Judaism is a religion. It's not a nationality. It never will be. People don't get land because they're religion. Christians don't get land because they're Christians. Muslims don't get land because they're Muslims. Jews don't get land because they're Jews. It's as simple as that. Only nationalities get land. Zionism is a racist political system. And it really is confusing. I know you know, you must know these things because they affect us. Man was saying, well, matter of fact, in the early days of our party, we used to fight against Zionists. You know what they used to say? FBI put out the rumor. Oh, they get a lot of money from the Arabs and they're carrying on the Arab struggles for them. Could you hear that? <laughs> like if Zionism is just attacking the Palestinians and don't do nothing to me. All of our political people in this country who say they represent us bow down before Israel. All of them, before they get elected, they wear a yarmulke cap to show everybody where they stand. They fall before the altar of Israel, hollering unconditional support. When Israel says jump, Bush says how high. <laughs> Go and ask our rap groups, and they will tell you who controls our culture in this country and the problems they have in trying to educate their youth. Zionism controls our politics in this country. Zionism controls our culture in this country. And people tell me it's not our enemy. If you don't want to fight, sit down. Don't cause confusion, Jack. Me, I'm a fighter for my people. And any force affects my people, I'm going to expose them and destroy them. That's my job. That's my job. I hate the enemy with a profound fashion. As profound a fashion as I love my people, I'm not confused. You can't say you love your people and not hate the enemy. <laughs> you don't hate the enemy because you don't love the people. Simple as that. And of course, we know we don't love the people. Because if we love the people, we would be in organizations studying the people's history. Can you say you love somebody and not want to know everything there is to know about that person? No way. How then can you tell me you love your people? And organizations, I'll tell you, we are so disorganized that bad organization is better than no organization at all. So you can run with that one somewhere else. Tell it to the clock. It's got